Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. How to be a better wildlife gardener. I'm sure we all try to, don't we, We Peter? do, Chris. Hmm. I, I think it's very important to recognise that us gardeners in the UK and across the world, mm. really, we are a massive benefit to the wildlife of the world, aren't we? I mean, mm. I, I love fight, feeding the birds, and I noticed a little baby robin was out feeding on the bird feeder the other day. Wonderful. It's, it, it's so nice to see them with their sort of fluffy feathers that haven't yeah. quite finished molting yet. Yeah, and as, and as we're in the middle of May, and also, um, yes, the, the birds are starting to do lots of nesting around, so it's obviously a, well worth remembering not to go out and cut you. <laughs> Cut your hedges just yet. Wait until That's well, right. yeah, wait until they've all uh, flown there from their nest. And also, yeah, things like uh, birds sort of starting to feed on on some of the shrubs and the roses as well for for aphids. So, you know, there is such a benefit, isn't there, for uh, for our wildlife to you know encourage them in all sort of shapes and forms. So, do you think they're feeding on aphids? Because mm. I, I always see the ladybirds and on my beans you know, feeding on, on the aphids. I love watching that; it's brilliant. It is, yeah. I have to say that on one of my roses, um, there is a few ladybirds, but unfortunately, I think they've been outnumbered by the the aphids this, this year. So that... <laughs> that is the trouble, isn't it? Mm. But... Indeed. Excellent. And who have we got joining us today then, Chris? So, we're, yeah, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Martin Fish, who is well known in the, the world of gardening from uh, Radio BBC broadcasts and his, his columns in the, many of the gardening magazines. So uh, somebody is a go-to person. I know he's, uh, he's, he's sort of fired up and ready to, to chat to us. Brilliant. So he- hello, Martin, and welcome to Dig It. Um, so on this morning, where, where do we find you? Um, yes, good morning, Chris. Um, I'm, I'm in North Yorkshire. I'm at home. I'm actually up in my little office looking out the window. So I, I live uh, in a village between midway between Ripon and Firth. So we're up Ooh. in North Yorkshire. People probably know of Firth as sort of James Herriot country. So I'm very lucky because I'm looking out my office window oh. upstairs out towards the Yorkshire Dales in the distance with a field full of sheep in front of me. It's so overcast, having said that, but the swallows have arrived. In the last couple mm. of days, so I'm watching the swallows fly around in the field opposite me, which is quite interesting to watch them. Oh, that's brilliant. You painted a lovely picture, Martin, of where you are. That's that's great. And the, the weather, well, yes, <laughs> it's it's May, so <laughs> we take it as it is. <laughs> I know, it's all, it's all very different at the minute, isn't it? Because, you know, I've been away for the weekend working and uh, we've had a, I don't know whether you have where you are, but we've had a very dry April up here in North Yorkshire. Uh, very, very little rain. You know, the, the veg garden is bone dry. Things are starting to struggle. In our, we've got very well-drained soil. Um, and April showers now seem to be a thing of the past. Over mm. the last few years, we've not had them. So it's obviously all part of this changing weather pattern that's happening. No, they certainly are. I've been watering my potatoes, which I don't think I've ever done in April before or moving into May now. So it, it, yeah. it's certainly seen, it's very dry down this end of the country as well. And Martin, perhaps we could start our discussion today by asking a little bit about you. In our last podcast, we noticed you're a very busy person out judging RHS flower shows at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, well, yes, judging flower shows and, and uh, talking at them, uh, not just for the RHS, it's it got into show season now. It's uh, it's almost silly season. It, it, and it, it coincides when I'd love to be at home doing the garden, but I'm just taken away from home <laughs> quite a lot at this time of the year. So my wife uh, ends up doing more of the gardening for certain times of the year than I do. So, yes, I, I mean, it started off, I was at Harrogate recently. The Harrogate show is the, the end of April. Uh, then um, we've had Harlow Carr, which has been um, their, their Easter, uh, their spring gardening weekend. So I was there doing talks uh, with my wife and and um, Jonathan Moser, the flower ranger. So we were there. Uh, off then to Malvern very soon, where I'm going to be judging for the RHS at Malvern. Then I get a couple of weeks at home when I can actually catch up on some gardening and, and all the things that are on my list. And then it'll be Chelsea. And then it goes on to Gardener's World, and then we've got Tatton and Hampton, and I'm at the Great Yorkshire Show, and, and a host of others, Southport and Chorley. So it, it more or less starts in sort of the third week in April and goes right the way through until the end of September uh, with lots and lots of shows. But it, it's something I love. I love the judging um, you know, with the RHS and at the independent shows. But I also love talking to the audiences, doing talks and demonstrations and Q and A sessions. So it's a it's a really nice mix, and it sort of creates this summer season of work for me. 
Mm, sounds very busy. Sounds like a very Hectic. full <laughs> diary. So, uh, Martin, you know, I, I'm looking at. I had a look at your uh, your bio on your on your website. You've obviously been in Garling for some time. Can you sort of tell us a little bit about your route to to uh, to where you are now? Right, right, yeah, how long have you got? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been a long we'll do the time. potted version. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it to under three hours, certainly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I left school um, when I was 16. Um, in those days, you could leave at 16. Um, and I, I grew up in Nottinghamshire, in, in the coal mining villages in North Nottinghamshire. Um, so um, most of my friends... Uh, from school, or an awful lot of them, when they left at 16, went to work down one of the, the village pits down the coal mines. And, and in, in fact, my family on my dad's side were all coal miners. My, my dad had been a miner. He'd, he'd come out of the pits and went into engineering, but my granddad and great granddad and going back. Um, and we've actually traced the family tree. I'm the first fish on the sort of direct line on my dad's side that hasn't been a coal miner uh, since 1792, so I well wow. and truly broke the mould. <laughs> um, but I got into gardening because uh, in the village where we lived, there was also a small nursery, which was literally at the bottom of our garden. We, we could climb over our fence at the bottom of the garden and get into the nursery. And my mum worked there at this time of the year. Uh, they, they grew bedding plants, it's, oh. you know, in the days when it was. this was in the 70s, and of course bedding then was, was huge. Uh, and she was working there for a few months in the spring, doing all the pricking out and, and then the sales. It's a very traditional little nursery. Uh, it wasn't a garden centre at all, just a nursery. Um, and I got a job there when I was 13 after school, uh, helping out, just filling the, the trays and moving the bags of compost around. And eventually I was allowed to do a bit of pricking out and seed sowing. And that was really, I suppose, what got me into gardening, plus my grandma was a very keen gardener um sort of she had a little cottage garden and i had an uncle that had an allotment so i used to spend a lot of time between the three and that mm. really made my mind up when i was 16 i wanted to be a gardener so i was lucky to get an apprenticeship on a local parks department i did my apprenticeship uh, went to college and did my day release and then went off to full-time college at mary's Wood in surrey where i did nursery practices uh, came back and worked for the, the councils for a while, then got a job as a head gardener. But my my dream was always to have my own nursery. So I was lucky that in my sort of late 20s, managed to buy a plot of land and start the nursery that we had in Nottinghamshire. And we stayed there for about 20 years. Um, but it was during that time when we had the nursery in the 90s that I uh, you know, got to do other things. So it's been quite a varied career, really. I've, I've done, um, you know, obviously work at shows and things now. But essentially, I've been gardening, very much practical hands-on gardening for the last 44 years. So, um, so yes, it was a, a strange routine. Mm. I was the only person I knew that was a gardener when I left school because it wasn't on the radar of any of my friends. It was mm. either stay on to do your A-levels, go and work down the village pit, or go and work sort of in engineering in the local town. So I, I uh, did something very different, and and don't regret it to this oh, day. It's the best say, decision he... I think I ever made. Mm, yeah, brilliant. And what did your nursery? What were you growing in the nursery? We were um, again not, not a garden centre. We were a nursery, and we we built it from a, a greenfield site. We bought six acres of land. We bought some second-hand glass old sort of Venlo type houses and polytunnels. We yeah. do a lot of bedding because of my council sort of training on the nursery, on the park, uh, on the parks department, we yeah. did all the bedding and all the pelagonians and the fuchsias. So we did that. And the reason being, cause it was a, a, a fast growing crop really. I needed to mm. get a return on my money so mm. we could do that. So we, we grew a lot of bedding. We would wholesale some, but then we also sold it from the nursery. Um, and then we were very lucky that the, the Parks Department nursery where I did my training in Newark, um, the, the nursery closed and the land was sold for buildings. So they needed somebody to grow the bedding plants for them. And they came to me and for the next to sort of 10 years, uh, we grew the bedding for the Parks Department and Nottingham Health Authority and supplied garden centres. And then we also branched out. We then, we did herba we did a bit of everything really. We did herbaceous, we did lots of shrub propagation. I like my nursery start. Um, we did trees, we did our own grafting and budding, some fruit. So it was a very small traditional nursery with a retail area. And then in the background, the wholesale bit that was uh, 
testifying to other people. Brilliant. Okay. So, so Martin, yeah, v- very varied early part of your career. But then, of course, you, you branched out into uh, doing some broadcasting on the, on the TV, radio, and, of course, writing in the, in the gardening magazines. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. I mean, it, it was while um, we, we were running the nursery, and it was in the sort of mid-90s, so the nursery was getting going nicely. Um, I used to do a bit of lecturing at the local college just to bring a bit of extra cash in while we were setting everything up. But I, I got the chance to do a gardening phoning on Radio Nottingham, BBC Radio Nottingham. Um, that was sort of February 1993, I think it was, um, with a chap called John Sterland, who we finished up working together. We, we still do occasionally, in fact. Um, so I went in. I'd never done this before. I'd listened to it on the radio, but to be invited in to answer questions was a, a great honour. Um, and it was a, a bit of a weird experience, really, because you're just sitting in the studio and there's just the two gardeners and a presenter and getting the questions through your headphones. So, um, But I loved it. And, and it turned out they were looking for a new radio partner for John because the, the chap he worked with previously sadly had died the year before. So they were trialling various people, but I did a couple of trials and then on the strength of that got the job. So we then became the permanent gardeners on Radio Nottingham um, and it, it just developed from there, really, because we got more airtime on the radio. We were given our own Sunday show, um, a gardening magazine programme. Um, I then started doing some television in the late 1990s for ITV with a guy called Alan Mason, who was, was quite a big name at the time. He was doing a lot on Channel 4, but he was also doing regional ITVs, Anglia, Central, Yorkshire. Um, so I did a few years with him, which was a really good to the learning ground into television, which is completely different to radio because it's a lot. It's a very slow process. Look, it's all pre-recorded. If you make a mistake, you start again. Or if a tractor goes by, you start again. If a cloud goes in front of the sun, you start again. Whereas radio <laughs> is live and punchy yeah. to the point. Um, it is. And that then led on. It, it, exactly, you know, it's, it's a very different concept. Um, that led on to the BBC because I was doing BBC Nottingham on the radio, which is where the television studios are for BBC East Midlands. So we were asked if we would do the gardening on the early evening news. Once a week, we just did a few tips and visited gardens around the region. So we did that for 10 years. We did, we had a one-year break where I did a series for uh, ITV with uh, Thelma Barlow. Um, oh, yes. But that was only a one, was one series. It wasn't recommissioned. So it was back to the BBC and did that up until... 2010, I think we <clears throat> we ended with the BBC. Sadly, now local regional television don't tend to do gardening anymore. It's all all national gardening. But it was a it was a great experience, and I really really enjoyed it. I met some amazing people and visited some wonderful gardens during the. I suppose in total about 14 years that I was doing it. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. And, uh, it is such a, an enlightening project doing doing radio, isn't it? The, the, uh, in my, my time I've done it over the years, you get some really interesting questions um, sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's good. And moving on to wildlife gardening, where would you point our listeners who want to start maybe creating a new flower bed or a new wildlife garden? Can you give us some ideas as to what the basics are behind sort of wildlife gardening or where to look for some yeah. ideas? I mean, I think any anybody, regardless of what size garden they've got, um, you know, even if you've only got a patio or a balcony, you can attract some form of wildlife onto it. So it's something that everybody can get involved with. And it's about the key things are, are providing the, the right environment i suppose to attract that wildlife in the form of sometimes it's by feeding you know that will attract especially birds if you're feeding the birds it attracts the birds uh, birds into the garden um you know giving them a habitat it can be you know nesting sites or somewhere to 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 live during the day or the night time um so it's a case of providing the right environment for them and i think you know if you go online there's there's lots of organizations you know, um, the Wildlife Trust, the um, RSPB, the Royal Horticultural Society and loads of others. There's lots of information out there how to get started. And, and, it, and you can start very simply to start with. Um, so I would you know, advise people maybe to look online. Um, there's lots of books and magazines on the subject as well, but also garden centres. Garden centres are a really good place to go to, you know, because they've got usually 
everything you need to get started. They sell the plants, the right sort of plants that will attract birds and pollinators and bees into your garden. They've got bird food. They've got nest boxes. They've got drinkers. You can go to a garden centre and pretty much get everything you need to get cracking with your wildlife garden be it large or small and the good thing is you can actually talk to somebody that knows about these products as well so there's lots of information out there so there's no excuse for anybody that wants to do it not doing it because it's all there that can be handed to them on a plate basically well, i think you had very good good ideas there martin thank you because i know in the garden center we sell everything from hedgehog houses to i mean you think the seed packets these days have all got the little bee symbols on mm-hmm. and there is certainly mm-hmm. a, a swan food and all, yeah. all sorts of stuff that we sell now yeah but. now the yeah the rhs are behind the the plants for pollinators obviously the little label little uh, bee signs on all the, the pots as well which makes it even easier for 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 our uh, but people just to pick up the right plants for the right place too. So, um, th- exactly, yeah, yeah. And thinking about how, on your your own garden, Martin, how, how have you sort of encouraged wildlife over the years, and how, how's the, the the sort of projects you've put in place to to achieve that? Well, I think a lot of it, Chris, is is just done because your garden. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it attracts wildlife, so you don't always have to do lots of things i think lots of people think oh we'd like to attract wildlife but they're probably already doing quite mm. a lot by the plants that they're growing so i certainly in my garden i i like trees and shrubs so i think if you've got room in your garden for any trees and shrubs then that is immediately creating that sort of environment that lots especially birds love that environment um you know you're almost like a little mini woodland you don't, and you don't need to have lots of trees it just be one or two smaller trees and a few shrubs working a few evergreens because they provide lots of shelter and protection um so that's a good start uh, and there's always insects in there as a food source for them as well and it gives them cover out and somewhere for them to nest um and then we we feed the birds at certain times of the year, um, which again helps bring them into the garden. And I think if you can get them into the garden when they're hungry, they will then help to sort of take any of the pests that we don't like. So we get this payback from them as well. And then it's a case of, you know, planting, um, you know, flowering plants so that we can get the bees and the pollinators. So very simple things to get started, really. And then you can build on it from there. Um, and, you know, I think when people start to attract a little bit of wildlife into the garden and they see it they think oh we'd like a bit more and you can do more things then and gradually build it up over time yeah i think you're very true uh, martin do you have any <laughs> this is an interesting question any sort of favorite wild animals which appear or have appeared over the years um well i think in our garden it's mainly birds we, we get a lot of birds uh, in the garden um which is good and, and we we had a, a tall hedge which um, we we sometimes get yellow hammers in because they like quite tall, dense hedges. But we get you know the the run of the mill birds and the finches and the blue tits and the blackbirds and bushes. Um, we were always looking, not in the garden really, but the house. And we, I say was because we have actually moved recently. We're we're taking on looking for a new project. So we still live in the same village, but we're actually in a different house. Why we're looking for something else? So our old garden is just down the road, but it was a an old property and with pantiled roofs and we used to get loads of house sparrows nesting in the roof under the pantiles where they weren't pointed in um, and I used to love that because you would be woken up in the in the late mm-hmm. spring and summer with the chirp 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 of the sparrows sometimes it was a bit of a pain but it was <laughs> lovely the swifts and we used to get the swifts in there as well oh, wow. which was great um, but yeah I, I just think you know it's um, it's for me. It's mainly birds. We would occasionally get the uh, hedgehog coming into the garden um, through the bottom uh, the field where there's there was a hole in a wall, and we would get the hedgehog in there. That was always quite fun when the hedgehogs came in. We were lucky because it backed onto open fields anyway, so you know we'd get quite a lot of wildlife around us. Um, we fortunately didn't get rabbits. I've got nothing against rabbits, but the <laughs> rabbits and gardens don't always mix very well. Definitely. So the rabbits never got in. Otherwise, that might have caused us a bit of a problem. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, because uh, I saw my first ever yellow hammer out on a bicycle ride recently. I'd, I'd never seen one, and they are such beautiful birds, aren't they? They, I've seen them in pictures, are, but yeah. the, when you actually see one for the first time in real life, you're like, wow, that is amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, we, we had one year, well, two or three years on the chart. Uh, and because sometimes you don't have to do anything. They just appear, don't they? We we had um, 
goldfinches nesting in a clematis, and it was a gold leafed one. I think it was is it clematis macropetalus goldwix gold, which has got a lovely bright gold foliage under the blue nodding heads. And we could see this bird going in, and I sat with my binoculars, and it was a goldfinch. I thought it was quite apt that a goldfinch was making its nest in a gold leaf <laughs> climate. So maybe camouflage. That's it. Now, we often talk on Diggit about creating wildlife meadows or allowing grass areas to become more natural. What are your thoughts on this, Martin? And have you got any practical advice on how to achieve a natural meadow type lawn? Yeah, I would probably say um, don't necessarily turn all of your lawn to a meadow. It, it depends on the garden, doesn't it? Um, mm. Because if you've got animals or you've got children, then it, it's not the most practical thing. So I, I think the way to do it is to probably create an area of your lawn as a, an, a, a meadow area and that way you can still have a moan part so that the ground feeding birds can come along you've got somewhere to put your deck chair if you've got children they've got somewhere to run but you can still have that more natural area so that that's the way i would approach it i think if you suddenly say i'm going to turn all my lawns into meadows not only can they be quite difficult to maintain um but it but it means you can't use that lawn for anything else so i would pick an area um, you know, maybe it could be the corners of a square lawn or if you've got a long, thin lawn, maybe the bottom third of it. And uh, so that it, it goes from a, a moan into the more natural areas you go down the garden. Always when you're mowing it, initially take the, the clippings off because the idea of creating a, a meadow area is you, you want it to be low in nutrients. So if you are, for example, feeding the rest of your lawn, don't feed the bit that you want to be your meadow. Okay. Because if you do, the grass just out-competes with the the, uh, the the wildflowers that you've got growing in there. So the, the theory is you want the grass to grow less, and that gives chance for the flowers to establish much, much better mm -hmm. in that type of area. And I think then, you know, you've got the option. You could just leave it natural if you want. And it's surprising if you just leave a piece of lawn to grow and if we're talking in true meadow terms, you know, you wouldn't be mowing it from, um, you know, spring until probably August, September time. So you are leaving it all the summer and the grasses will grow and they will produce lovely flower heads on them, which in themselves are quite attractive. But also any any what we class as lawn weeds in there, clovers and buttercups and daisies and ajugas, that type of thing will, will grow uh, and you'll get the flowers uh, in there as well. So you will get a, a mixture in there. Um, you could take that a step further if you wanted to, and some people buy the seed, or probably the easiest way is to buy plugs uh, yeah. of, of wildflowers, meadow wildflowers, and, and just make a hole and push them in and keep them watered to help them establish. And then you can have all sorts of things growing in your lawn that will come back every year. And then, of course, what we do with it, we have to mow it eventually at the end of the season. Um, and... It would probably be done, um, you know, late August, September time when everything's flowered, produced its seed and dropped to the ground. You would then cut it. It's quite difficult to do with a lawnmower at that stage. So it's usually <laughs> going to be shears or a, a strimmer yeah, uh, or so. something like, yeah, because your mower would just completely choke up. And then you can rake that. Well, the, 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 the ideal way is to cut it, leave it to lay on the ground for a few days so any seeds can fall out. Then you can rake it off. That can go into your compost bin. That will uh, help to rot down and make compost for the garden. And you've got the grass back to its ordinary level. It won't be green. It will look very scorched and, and pale because you've, you've taken all the green off. And what it will do then over the autumn and winter is green up and you'll get several inches of growth. And then the cycle starts again in the following year. So it, it's quite easy to do. Um, but it can take two or three seasons to get that sort of balance of grass growth and the wild flowers in there as well. Um, and it, I think they, it can look very effective in certain gardens in certain areas. It, it sort of creates a sort of a, a vista to look at or you can mow a path through it to get this lovely meandering walk through a little meadow. So it, it, does, it can work very well indeed. Yeah. And the great thing is birds will love it, butterflies will love it, little creatures, the invertebrae. Uh, will be in there as well. Little froglets will be in there. So it, it just creates a nice habitat for a different range of wildlife. Brilliant. That's a, uh, some great tips there. Thank you. And yeah, obviously thinking about the garden pond um, mm. and froglets uh, and mm. I mean newts are 
uh, I, I've always been fascinated by newts, and I found a few in my garden just under a rotten wooding, a, a rotting wooden plank. And I was like, "What? Oh, this is, is, is amazing when you sort of unearth these little creatures, mm. isn't it?" It's definitely. And the uh, ponds it are is, yeah. ponds are so useful in the garden, aren't they? They are really useful because you know we talk about feeding the birds and providing habitat and shelter and all this, but they they need water. Every living thing needs water. So whether it's bees, honeybees, bumblebees, butterflies, birds, mammals, uh, reptiles, they all need water. So, um, yeah, if you can have water in some form in the garden, it doesn't have to be a huge pond at all. Um, I mean, I've got a friend that um, she's only got a very small garden. It's a small terrace garden, and she's got lots of wildflowers in there and and pollinating uh, plants for pollinators. But she's made a very simple pond out of a large washing up bowl okay. that she's just sunk into the ground. Um, and she's made it so the rim is level with the ground. She's put a few rocks around it, a few rocks in it so anything that gets in can get out. Um, and she's she's got a couple of very small um, little plants growing in there. She has to replenish the water and top it up on a regular basis. But she said it's amazing how much wildlife that small area of water attracts. She's had damselflies. She occasionally gets, well, she gets the frog in there and frog spawn. She's not had newts or anything, but the birds are constantly drinking out of it. And there's insects around it. So it doesn't have to be big um, to, to get wildlife into the garden but water yes is a, is a key part of it, attracting any form of wildlife yeah they do say it's a it's a magnet isn't it it just draws everything in and i think certainly in come the, the summer it's usually teeming isn't it and uh, however small what sort of um thoughts on on this uh, martin you know if you're planning to put a little wildlife pond in is there any any sort of things you know little tricks which we we could read from your, your from your experience there yeah, I mean, um, as I said, it doesn't need to be big. You might want something bigger than a washing up bowl. Uh, I mean, you can buy preformed little ponds in garden centres or uh, or a liner. Um, so yes, dig out your hole. You know, it's not got to be three feet deep, but don't make it two or three inches deep either, because that is is going to uh, just you know dry up very quickly and get too warm. So you're probably going to need eighteen inches of depth. Uh, shallow end to it so that anything that gets in can get out. You can almost create a little beachy effect with it, really. Um, and then I would say, you know, um, put it somewhere not necessarily in the hottest part of your garden where it's in direct sunlight, because that will turn the water like pea soup very, very quickly. Um, the water will need some shade. So it can be in dapple shade where you've got maybe some trees overhanging that will shade it for part of the day during the really hot time. Um, or you could plant some oxygenating plant in there or some floating weed in there or something like a, a dwarf um, water lily. So that, that will shade the water. You need to keep the water cool. You don't want it to get too hot. Um, and I just think if you put a few plants around that and have it so that you've got some cobbles going down into the water again so things can get in and get out, uh, it can work really well. And, and, of course, the thing is, don't, try and make a fish pond, an ornamental fish pond, a wildlife pond. A fish pond with fish in it will attract birds to drink out of it, but the two don't mix so well. If you've got lots of uh, things like mayflies and dragonflies and, and frogs and toads in there, then the fish will eat the, the young and the, the pupae and the larvae. So it's best not to have fish. If you want it to be a true wildlife pond, I would forget about the fish and just let nature take its course. And you'll be amazed if you were to create a pond any time now within the next few weeks, within a, within, a, within a matter of only weeks of doing it, you'll be surprised how much wildlife is visiting your garden to come and find that water. Excellent. Thank you. So, Martin, you know, thinking about our wildlife area, um, what sort of things do we need to be considerate of as, as gardeners as we as we manage this, this area? Is there any, any thoughts on on what we might need to do and maybe things we can we can try yeah i mean i think if we if we are uh, you know determined that we want to attract wildlife into the garden we don't want to be doing anything that's going to harm them so certainly um things like insecticides and um, there are some you know fairly strong that it's good that there aren't as many of the really powerful insecticides around now lots of them have gone but there's still insecticides out there 
So, you know, don't use them if you can help it. If you do need to use them, then I always say, you know, that some of, there are some very good organic insecticides out there, plant-based ones, that, that are contact use. So they touch the pest and they will kill it. So if you do have to use any insecticide, because it's not for me to tell people they can't or they can, then use them carefully and use them maybe, you know, sort of late evening when the birds have gone uh, you know, to roost um, and it's all calm and just target the pests that you see. But certainly don't use them willy-nilly all over the place. And the same goes for sort of, you know, lots of the weed killers and that type of thing. So I think we all need to be aware that we're not using as many pesticides and that type of thing in the garden. Um, and that, that will greatly help then to build up the wildlife because if you're not killing every aphid in the garden and there's no need to, that will attract the birds into it. I, 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 a few years ago, we had quite a bad aphid infestation on some climbing roses. And the temptation is to reach for the insecticide and spray it. But it was around this time of the year. And you thought, well, now, if you actually wait, the blue tits nesting in the bird boxes will feast on those. And they didn't take every one, but they kept them under control. So it didn't cause any damage to the roses. But it, the, the byproduct is the blue tits had lots of food for their chicks in the nest. So... We don't want to take away that food. I think that's something we need to bear in mind. Yeah, I suppose it's this, this idea of managing pests, is it, rather than controlling them. I think that's the thing, is getting, getting the balance balance right. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. And that, that takes a while to do. And, and occasionally you might need to control something, even if it's a case of just squashing a few uh, sort of caterpillars on your cabbages by fingers. Because, so, you know, we, at the end of the day, if you want it to be your garden, you want the crops to grow as well. So it's just getting that balance so that you're happy and the, the wildlife's happy and everybody's catered for, really. So, but I, I think you know, something that I've learned uh, over the last few years with my gardening experiences is that reality is, is that, yeah, quite often you do end up with, say, like aphids on your run of beans. But... At the end of the day, does it really matter that much if you grow maybe an extra plant or two than possibly than you actually need? Leave the bugs to get on with it, and yeah. like you say, sort of let the blue tits feast on them. And I mean, my experience mm. is they've always managed to grow through the initial pro- sort of outbreaks of the uh, mm. of the aphids, and then, like you say, sort of the birds get fed. We, we can do our bit for nature just by growing plants, as it were. <laughs> Exactly. No, I, I totally agree. You know, yes. I mean, and, and aphids, they can do damage, but they don't do that much. And like you said, on runner beans, you get the little black bean aphid on there. And they, they don't normally do that much damage. Um, and, you know, if there's too many, then you can just squash a few with your fingers. But don't take them all for that very reason, because the birds will come and feast on them. And, you know, things like lacewings will eat the aphids. So it's not only birds that eat them, it's lots of insects will eat them as well. So they're all doing their bit to help keep the garden healthy for us, I suppose. So, yeah, we mustn't be too particular and kill everything that moves. That's it. And should we actually be feeding the birds? What are your thoughts on bird feeders and putting the, mm, the so peanut cool. well, yeah. feeders out? Are they? I mean, I, I, personally, I've always thought it helps them, therefore it must be good, but... It's getting the balance, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, I think there's, there's different schools of thought on this. and I'm, I'm not an expert, but sort of just from observing i suppose i mean yeah we we feed the birds certainly in the winter we feed the birds um, and i think that's the time when they probably need more of a helping hand isn't it um and you know you can put there's a whole range isn't it, of different foods you can put out for them i think there is a school of thought isn't there also and i'd say that i'm not doing this from a scientific point of view but there are quite a few diseases now within birds green finches for example uh, they get a disease and they, and it's thought that they can get it from bird tables because it's just transmitted from one bird to another okay. um so i think if you are feeding the birds you need to be quite clean make sure you clean your feeders clean your bird table down make sure the water's always refresh so it's not you know green water um just to prevent disease transmission and i think with what's happened in the last two years with coronavirus we all know how quickly some diseases can spread and with birds they are suffering with various diseases as well but we feed in the winter we put a selection of feed out but we we don't tend to feed um from sort of late spring well even before now we would we would have stopped feeding uh, sort of end of March when the weather warms up and there's more natural food around and it might be wrong it might be right I don't know but my thought is if you carry on feeding the birds constantly 
you know, like come into a fast food bar, they don't have to think about searching for food because they know that there's going to be peanuts, there's going to be seeds, nigella seeds, all these range of foods for them. They can come and pick exactly what they want. Whereas if it's not there, then they've got to do what nature intended. They've got to find their own food and look for grubs and seeds in the soil and aphids and caterpillars and all the natural food they get, which is high in protein. So we don't feed now right the way through till probably it gets really cold in winter because there's lots of food available through the summer and the autumn. And then when it gets to really cold weather, probably December, we feed for you know three months again just to give them a bit of a boost and and i think that will encourage the birds you've attracted them into your garden by feeding and then if there's lots of wildlife friendly plants in there uh for them to feed on and there's the shelter there they'll hopefully stay in your garden and there will be a food source as well because you're not spraying every bug and beast that moves around so i think that's all part of getting the balance but that is only martin's opinion Mm -hmm. somebody might say that's completely wrong uh, and if they do, please tell me. But I, I think the birds, they, they need to find food. You know, in, in the where we live, we look looking out over fields. Nobody's feeding the birds out there. And there's a lot of birds. So they can find the food. Yeah. So we mustn't make them too dependent, I think, on, on bird food. Now, bird food manufacturers are probably screaming, as I say this. <laughs> but feed them, but not overdo it. Yeah. <laughs> a bit of a balance, isn't it? It's a bit of a balancing act. And thinking, Martin, about the, the sort of plants you might put into your garden to attract the wildlife do you have any particular favorites have you got a bit of a hit list of what you would definitely recommend uh, our listeners have a, a think about planting yeah it's a difficult one that chris because it's mm. like you know your gardener if somebody says what's your favorite plant yeah. today you'll have a favorite plant today but if they ask you next Indeed. week you'll have a different one won't you we will um i think <laughs> exactly yeah you both will it's, it's just the nature of the job we're in and everybody that's got a garden it's seasonal isn't it um i i think the the thing is to aim to have uh, a range of plants that um, are there for a long period. It's very easy to get plants at this time of the year and through the summer, but wildlife needs uh, plants all year round, especially if they're bees and pollinators. Um, and, you know, birds need shrub cover and trees uh, all year round. So I think it's important that we, when we're planning our garden, we think about that and make sure that, you know, you can start as early as, you know, winter time with some flowering plants, you know, some of the early uh, late winter spring flowering plants that are going to be there that will feed the, you know, because you get the early pollinators coming out, you you know, you get the crocuses in flower and you'll see the odd stray bumblebee mm-hmm. on a warm day has come out to have a feed. So it's important that we've got, you know, things like hellebores and mahonias and crocuses and snowdrops starting us off that type of thing and then you know once you get to this time of the year there's a plethora of different plants so there's, there's not so much of a problem we've got all the lovely blossoms we've got you know apples and pears and plums in blossom plus the ornamental trees and then through the summer all the lovely annuals and summer flowering perennials so there's this bag so i haven't really got any no. favorites but you know things like corners through the summer are brilliant the the Dahlias with the single flowers are really good. Um, Foxgloves are perfect uh, for getting you know the bees into them. The herbaceous ground cover geraniums are really good. Um, it just goes on and on and on, really. Um, so I, I think do a bit of research. And I always tell people, and it applies to wildlife gardening, anybody saying, I want to plant my garden, I'm going to go to the garden centre and buy the plants. I say, well, don't do one visit go to your garden centre, even if you don't buy every time, go on a monthly basis because then you'll see the range of plants that are available and in season throughout the whole of the year. And we need to apply that to the wildlife garden so that whatever month of the year, there is something beneficial to wildlife in your garden, whether it's got seed heads on it, flowers, berries or fruit. That's uh, that's sage advice, uh, Martin. It's something I always sort of mention to, to our customers here. And uh, you can always tell the, the fair weather gardeners because their gardens look amazing through the months of April, May, maybe early June. And then obviously it tends to not look quite as colourful. So you know, some great, great uh, thoughts there. Thank you. 
Martin, I know you're not the greatest fan of rewilding. However, we're sure if the idea of a wild, untrimmed, untamed garden, sort of like my garden is at the <laughs> some of the year, <laughs> being a lazy gardener, <laughs> this uh, uncared for look appeals to many people around the UK, doesn't it? Why do you feel that you couldn't embrace the rewilding chaos? I think um, maybe because of my background and training, because I trained as a gardener, on parks department yeah, and, and in I... private gardens. And, and it, that is the way I garden. But I, I still think, uh, and I know rewilding is sort of the, the, the trendy thing at the moment, but I, I've seen, I don't know many people do it, to be fair. I, I think there's probably not as many people rewilding in the true sense of the world as we're sometimes led to believe, mm. maybe by the media. Because I think um, for two reasons, I want my garden to look, nice i love plants a garden for me is all about the range of plants that you grow i'm not big on heavy landscaping i'll have some the minimum but it's the plants are the stars of the show and i want as big a range of plants that makes the garden look good for 12 months of the year and i think if you do that um and as we've already talked about plants with seeds and flowers and berries and fruits and you've got the correct habitat by having, you know, ground cover plants. So there's, there's cover there for small mammals. And then you've also got your shrubby mid height and your trees with a bit of taller height. You're covering all bases, basically. You've got nesting sites and habitat and, and everything that you need. Um, and I don't necessarily think that completely letting your garden go wild and not doing anything, just letting nature take over, will encourage that much more in the way of, way of wildlife um, you might get a bit more, but I don't think it's going to increase it that much because I think a garden that's well managed will also increase, uh, encourage a, a great deal of wildlife. Now, you don't have to be you know, pre precise with everything. You, know, you don't think you've got to be mowing your lawn every day. I don't do that. I like my garden to be fairly natural. I don't mow the grass too close. I mulch it, um, so I'm not having to feed it. Um, you know, I don't do all my shrubs so they're all mounded over i let them grow fairly natural i like to plant close in the borders with herbaceous i don't like to see bare soil so you know between the shrubs is ground cover and low perennials so it still creates this this understory but it looks right i think and that's what i want my garden to look like and I, and i think from a point of view if you've only got a small garden and with the size of gardens that they're building with new houses at the moment they're just very small mm. but mostly and i think if you were to let that everybody let it go wild i just think it would look terrible i really do yeah. I think if you've got a huge garden and you can leave a part of it to go wild fine but i think in an average size sort of urban garden i think if everybody just said right let's forget it we're going to get rid of the lawns get rid of the mowers get rid of the hose we're never going to weed again and let everything grow and go wild i just I don't think it would look very nice. And I think people would get fed up with it, to be fair. Mm. So I think it's back to this balance again. You you can still have a very attractive garden with a range of ornamental plants in. It's just choosing what you've got. Garden sensibly, garden with wildlife in mind, as we've said, no pesticides and, and making sure there's food and habitat and everything they need. And you will still get a wealth of wildlife all through the year. I think that's very true, because to be fair, my neighbour's house was unlived in for about 15 years, and it had a nice garden. I mean, it's a 1930s house, so sort of 30 metre long garden by maybe 10 metres wide, and it had just become totally overgrown with brambles, and... Yes, there was a lot of wildlife in there. I mean, no, my lawn was testament to the fact that the I, I think that's where the chafer grubs were coming from that mm. were infesting my lawn. Mm -hmm. And one year we had foxes in the garden breeding, which, I mean, a bit like your sparrows in the roof. It's a nice mm. experience. I mean, they're a bit noisy and I'd never had foxes living so close to me. But honestly, you couldn't use the garden. You couldn't get from one end to the other because it was just totally overgrown. Mm. And I think your comments about keeping it sort of well-planted and lots of things growing in there attracts a probably a far greater diversity of wildlife and it means that you can actually use the garden as well as having it looking nice. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. I, that, and that's my 
thought on it. And, you know, if people want to grow weeds in the garden, because, you know, things like dandelions and nettles are beneficial to certain insects and butterflies at certain times of the year. Again, just have a, have a patch. Don't do all your garden, like we said with the, the meadow, have a patch of your lawn, but have a patch of the garden or a border that you think, well, that is the bit where we're going to let some of the weeds grow. But you don't have to do it on the, the whole of the gardens. Otherwise, it, it just looks overgrown. Martin, I suppose that takes us to, our, to the next question, actually. Something a little bit less severe than uh, real wilding. But uh, your thoughts on uh, No Mo May, which we're obviously in now. We are, aren't we? Yes. Uh, I, I do not do No Mo May, I'm afraid. Um, I, um, I'm not a big fan of it because... I just think, again, the practicalities. Um, I think what I, what I do in our garden, I, I, lawns to me are an important part of the garden. I know some people don't bother with lawns anymore because of the maintenance and, and lots of garden designers don't include them in designs. Um, you know, they'll put gravel down or hard landscaping. But for me, a lawn is an essential part of a garden. Um, we've got, you know, we had quite a big garden and, and the lawns formed a lot of the structure of it and the path that linked the various parts of the garden together so they they were mown as i already mentioned i I don't mow too close i use a rotary mower i use it on a mulch setting uh, mow little and often um, and it gives you a really good thick sward of grass that's hard wearing and you get quite a lot of wildlife on that certainly ground feeding birds what i do do is have a little area further down the garden where i used to grow some fruit trees um you know it's like like a mini orchard i wouldn't mow that one probably not not just may i'd leave that quite a lot so i'd almost create a little meadow area but i think the problem with the no mow may um if it's your main lawn in your garden yes you'll be surprised that in a month some of the the the, what we call lawn weeds will flower the buttercups and the daisies will flower um but when you get to june and your grass is a foot high and really really thick it really difficult to mow it with your mower so you're going to get the shears out you're going to get the strimmer and it really weakens the grass if you've got long grass and you cut it really short that has a real weakening effect on it and it actually then allows even more weeds to get in so you finish up at the end of the day if you do this on a regular basis without the lawn you just have a weed patch so i think rather than say no mow may i would say don't mow a little bit of your lawn create your little wildflower area but road mow the mess rest but not too short and yeah. um, one thing that i have tried and it worked very well um we had this is in a previous house we had our, our lawns were originally fields and they were mown it's when we had the nursery so we had a lot of grass and we had quite a lot of uh, buttercups in there and we had lots of daisies and i got this idea i saw it on a holiday once up in scotland and they'd mown and left big circles so they'd created circles that weren't mown within a larger lawn circles of different sizes and allowed the weeds wildflowers to grow in those so you could finish up with a daisy circle or a buttercup circle and that looked really impressive and at the end of it it's much easier to maintain and cut down rather than the whole of the lawn that's not being mown we all know what it's like don't you go on holiday for a fortnight and come back and your lawn is really difficult to get it back is, under yeah. control if you do it for a whole month it's it's a nightmare to do so i think the practicalities sort of rule it out for me oh, that's fair that's enough fair enough yeah uh, can i ask you two are you are you no mow may fans mm, personally no, I, no. I, I, i've just bought a robot mower so um i'm hoping that it'll be <laughs> mowing it every two three days uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and i've actually got rid of rid of my lawn um after and it's over to plant so i made a, a conscious decision however my neighbor who had artificial lawn up uh, uh, installed about three years ago uh, the house went empty for about uh, nine months and in that time the artificial lawn became weed infested <laughs> so <laughs> e- e- even if you're doing lo- no mow may with an artificial lawn you've got you've got problems so <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't i don't like artificial lawns at all no, i no. don't if you if you I, I, I cannot see the point of an artificial lawn really no. so uh, um if you if you if you don't want to mow the grass then i'd say gravel it and do what you've done yeah. Chris plant a lot more interesting plants in it but I just think it ah, it doesn't work for me no no it's not definitely it maybe has a place somewhere but perhaps not in the, in the, in the gardening yeah. world perhaps <laughs> lovely thank you yeah and the great thing about a real lawn of course is it you know it, it absorbs huge amounts of carbon uh, mm-hmm. from the atmosphere it gives off oxygen uh, you know it helps with drainage and prevents runoff 
uh, and looks good all year round. It's evergreen. When the gardens, you know, lots of plants have died down in the winter and the garden's not looking as colourful. If you've got a, a lawn, you look out, at least you've got some green in the garden. It just, I think, lifts your spirits looking out to a green patch in, in the uh, winter months. So I think there's a lot of benefits for having a lawn in the garden. Absolutely, mm. yeah. Totally. Mm. Yeah, you, you talked earlier about uh, circles in the lawn with daisies and various different types of um, plant, uh, sort of flowering plant. Have you got any favourite uh, sort of uh, any favourite plants to grow in the lawn, like daisies or um, poppies? Yeah, I mean daisies. I, I do like daisies. I think daisies work really well. Uh, buttercups can look good, but they can spread because it's usually the creeping buttercup, so they they can spread. Um, and sort of go all over the place if you're not careful with them. So you've got to be a bit careful. I've seen it where people have planted, where they haven't grown the grass too, uh, mown the grass too short. If you're sort of mowing it to a couple of inches, you can get away with growing, you know, the, the, the wild primroses in there um, because once they flower, they tend to die down anyway. Yeah. So you could leave a circle. And, that, and they look amazing. I mean, round us at the moment, the primroses, they're coming to the end, but they're, in some of the verges, they just look beautiful. And then another couple of weeks, they're gone. The foliage seems to die down. The grass grows over them. And, and they're dormant until next spring. So primroses work really well in that situation. And another one is clover. Um, if Lots of people yep. have clover in the lawns. Um, and clover, of course, we know is, is beneficial. It, it fixes nitrogen, the roots do. But if you mow your lawn regularly, then you cut the flowers off. Um, but if you leave a patch where you've got clover and just mow round, and it looks really good if it's actually a, a proper circle rather than a regular shape, and let the clover flower, um, you get the clover flowers because the bees love it. it it's like a, a magnet to the bees. Um, I know some people don't want bees in the garden because they would with children, but if you leave them alone, they're normally fine, but they will just love that. And of course, then when it finishes flowering, you can just cut it down and you're back to a lawn again. So there's quite a few that work really well like that. Yeah, definitely, because I know, well, we've got seven hives here at the moment at the garden centre that we look after. And the honey that they produce after feeding on clover is a really lovely flavour as well. Mm. So I thoroughly recommend people to grow clo uh, clover in their garden if they can. Yeah, so on, on that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and Martin, on, on the, the subject of bees, is there any tips on helping our bees, uh, our bee pollinators in the garden? Is there anything you'd, you'd sort of say we could uh, work to? Well, yeah, I mean, we, um, well, I've never kept bees, but we, a friend of ours keeps hives, and, and for the last six or seven years, he had a hive down the bottom of our garden. We used to put it in our little mini orchard. Um, and um, we we benefited from it because we felt that we got a much better crop of apples because of the extra pollination that his bees were giving us. So it was a, a payback, really. Um, I mean, certainly plant-wise, we've got it, as we've already touched on, we need flowers from early season. People think bees are only around in the summer. You obviously, beekeepers, you know that's not true. You get a, a day in early spring when the sun's out, and the hive warms up, they'll send a few out to see what's out there. So it's back to what we said earlier, make sure you've got a really uh, good selection of flowering plants from you know February, March, right the way through until autumn time. So there's always something there. I mean, of course, bees will fly long distances in search. I mean, at the moment around us, we've got lots of the yellow oilseed rape. So, you know, they'll be forgetting the, the little primroses probably and going off and finding the rape. But certainly make sure you've got a good uh, selection of, of flowers. And think also blossom, you know, apple blossom and pears and plums, all the fruit blossom. The, the bees absolutely love it. And we've touched on it again and because it all keeps coming back, doesn't it? Water, bees need water. Um, so they've got, they've got to have a source of water to drink with. Um, and it's something that, I, although our friends looked after them in our garden before, when I've got more time and I'm not away at all the shows, one day I will have a hive in the garden because it just fascinates me to sit and watch the bees. And, you know, whenever Nick came to, to do anything with him, he'd, he'd say, come down with me. And they were just so gentle with him, the bees. He would never wear gloves and they'd be crawling on his hands. And I just... I just thought that was a, 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 an amazing relationship between him and those thousands of bees in that hive. They they obviously trusted each other. They do, and uh, I mean, having worked with bees now for a few years, I mean, it's the first time you take open the hive up and you're like, my word, there's thousands of like stinging insects in there. Are they going to attack me? And they don't. It's, it's the most magical sort of hobby in that sense that you get. It's such, I, I find it very relaxing as well. It, it's really. 
a, a great hobby to have and I thoroughly recommend you take it up because you will find hopefully mm. that it, it lots to learn and equally they're so beneficial like you say the apple orchard that you had probably um, I don't doubt the fact that it, it cropped far better because of the bees and I, mean, I find that different colours of honey fascinating you think a sycamore mm. no, when a sycamore flowers the bees will feed off that and they will come back and create an almost black honey from it and the different variations you get from all the different things that they've been feeding on it's a, a whole nother subject <laughs> it's, yeah, absolutely yes yeah yes i once had some honey in scotland i was working at a show and i think it was from the pine trees okay pine forest and that was a really really uh, almost resinous type uh, honey really dark honey as well so yeah it's uh, interesting you know that the honey varies so much depending on what they're feeding on Massively so, yeah, definitely. And I'm um, thinking about children. What are the best plants for them to be growing to bring some wildlife into the garden? Because obviously children love, well, I, I know sunflowers are always a popular one with children. Can you think of some other plants maybe that are very good at in, in, uh, getting the bugs and the bees into the garden? Yeah, I mean, I, I think sunflowers is probably the obvious one, um, and all children like them. But, you know, things like the English marigolds are, are really good for attracting um, wildlife into the garden, um, insects and, and butterflies and bees, and, and they're so easy to grow. Because I think if you're trying to encourage children to garden, whether it's for wildlife or just to get them out into the garden, you want something they're going to get fairly fast results with, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was young, um, people gardening so-called gardening experts at the time would say oh, to get children into gardening get them to grow a row of radishes uh, because they're fast growing but which they are but i can't think of many five-year-olds that would like to eat <laughs> raw radishes <laughs> you know they're not the, they, they might want to grow them but they don't want to eat them. nothing better so, than a nice um, peppery radish come on Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well, well no but i think it's, a, it's, it's an acquired yeah, taste isn't it's it when you get older yeah. i love radishes now yeah. and, and i remember being on holiday many years ago in germany and they were they were, I, was, I was staying with friends and they were drinking German lager pills and, uh, and they, were, they were having a, a, the lager but, and they would have, instead of peanuts or crisps, they had radishes and the two go together so well, you must try that. <laughs> wow. um, but things like English marigolds, yeah, it's, it's that, that peppery taste and the, the uh, sort of pills lager yeah. seem to work really, really nice as a snack, so try it. Oh, well. um, but yeah, English marigolds, strawberries, I always think strawberries is a really good way to get children to garden because you can buy a plant at this time of the year in a pot from a garden centre, put it into a slightly bigger pot or into the garden and you're going to get a few strawberries on it this year. But you also got the flowers that the bird, the, the uh, bees and the pollinators like. Um, cosmos is another one. You don't have to grow it from seed because, again, you know, you'll find them in nurseries and garden centres, the tall ones, the dwarf ones, but they just flower and flower and flower. Mm. Um, and, you know, the gain wildlife love them um and i and I've, I've, you know lots of fruiting plants i think are really worth getting children to grow because it not only encourages the wildlife but it teaches them a little bit about where our food comes from as well so it, it's got another string to its bow yeah and sort of thinking about uh, other wildlife i mean like butterflies wonderful graceful creatures they are and uh, we're starting to see quite a few of them now um although is it just just the cabbage white flies i don't know but uh, can you suggest any <laughs> any plants that might uh, encourage some of the more unusual butterflies which we we all hearken and ponder to see yeah i mean some of them do are, are quite specific aren't they mm. some of them uh, and, and, and I, I don't claim to be a, an expert on butterflies i love to see them in the garden but I know sort of from what I've sort of read on them in the past, some of them are quite specific. Um, but even a range of gardening plants, you know, will attract an awful lot of them into your garden. Uh, you know, things like your buddleias and uh, your verbena benariensis and all of that type of thing, cosmos, the butterflies will go on them. But I, we gain, then we can, this comes back to having some weeds in the garden, stinging nettles, aren't it? The perennial nettles are important for and i can't off the top of my head remember which butterfly it is but one of them needs the, the the food from there but what we're looking for are plants that are nectar rich and if you really want to encourage moths and butterflies because you know we, we forget about the moths sometimes but there's some beautiful moths about in the garden and they again all do a very valuable job for us then there are some really good websites um i think the the, the wildlife trust have information on about it 
And as far as I know, the RHS do on specific plants for specific butterflies, but for sort of lots of the generals, you know, your red admirals and that type of thing, flowering plants late summer with our nectar rich and single are really good to attract them into the to the garden. So definitely worth doing. And you know, we've got to also think I think not only about feeding them, but they, they you need somewhere where because they will overwinter. So somewhere you often find them, don't you, in the sort of window of a garden shed or something where they've been overwintering, but dense shrubs, plants growing against the wall is good ivy. Um lots of people don't like ivy on walls, but it is is so good for wildlife, for insects and butterflies overwintering and moths, as well as nesting birds. And it, it's warm and protected. So you've got to provide the habitat as well as the food source. I was going to say, the one plant I do grow for moths in uh, my garden, Nicotiana, the good old, because uh, uh, obviously some of them are sort of night sort of scented. Um, but uh, yeah. Nicotiana, um, they used to, I think if I remember rightly, the flowers used to sort of close up, but now they've bred them to the flowers are open day and night. So that attracts quite a lot of more unusual moths, which is... That's right. Nice. Yeah, and exactly. And, and things like the night-scented stocks and all of those mm, you know, that, that are giving off a scent in the evening will attract the moths, definitely, yeah. Yeah, good ones. Mm. And in the time you've been an RHS judge, have you noticed any changes in the way the garden designers and people are creating gardens now? and how things have changed and we're going towards a more sort of wildlife orientated garden? Yes, I think so. Certainly, you know, if you go back 20 years and look at your average show garden, I think they have changed. I mean, design and styles change as well, but I think designers are very much more uh, sort of, you know, uh, appreciating that people want to attract wildlife into the garden. Um, So yes, you'll see that when they're doing their gardens, um, they'll very often have um, lots more plants for pollinators. Um, and, you know, I've judged gardens at, at Tatton before and at Malvern where they've done the theme, you know, gardens for attracting bees and pollinators. So I think that's very much at the forefront of design is that we need to be doing that thing to, uh, to, to you know, look after the wildlife in the garden. And even on the nurseries uh, in the floral marquees, there's quite a lot of herbaceous nurseries. And you mentioned that the you know the, the symbols that they put on labels now to say plants are bee pollinators. Yep. Lots of growers will make a, a big feature of that on their displays um, because it partly drives sales, but it's also encouraging the public to buy these plants because we all need to do our little bit. I mean, I, I forget how many gardens there are in the UK, but it's twenty odd million, isn't it? Gardens in the UK, um, some large, some small. But if everybody can do their little bit and plant a few plants that are good for pollinators and attracting wildlife, overall that has a, a massive impact uh, on the environment. So, yeah, certainly show gardens uh, more naturalistic in their planting, water in there, um, and plants that are wildlife friendly, the grasses, that type of thing. Yeah. And the exhibitors in the floor market, definitely you notice with them that they are, especially the herbaceous ones, because it's very much down their street, are offering a bigger range of plants that, are good for wildlife and butterflies and birds and bees and all of that type of thing. Brilliant. And I suppose alongside that, have you noticed that the show organisers have become more sort of carbon neutral or are doing more things to help the environment at all? Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, I think lots and lots of people, I suppose, you know, in, in your industry as well, I suppose, it, everybody's trying to play their part now. I think, you know, people aren't taking it seriously, which is good. And certainly the RHS, they've got a, a sustainability, uh, sustainability policy. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, Brilliant. Their plastic bags at the shows um, from the exhibitors will be phased out uh, in a year or so's time. So at the moment, they're all using. Um, biodegradable ones but they will be phased out completely so it will be other packaging paper or cardboard or whatever Um, so that's something that's going peat as we all know big debate there of course about peat uh, but the RHS will ban peat at their gardens and shows in 2025 Right. Um, so plants will all be grown peat free Um, and they're also you know reducing single use plastics so all the restaurant areas and this isn't just the RHS this is your independent shows like your Harrogates and your Southports and Chorleys and Shrewsbury's and Malvern's that run shows, 
you know, in the cafeteria areas, you know, you won't be able to get your plastic cups anymore. So they're very much thinking across the whole of the showground ways that they can reduce their carbon footprint, um, which is good. You know, if everybody, again, does their little bit, it's all going to help, isn't it, in the long run? Most definitely. And that's great to hear, mm. isn't it, Chris? Yes, and I think, yeah, and it, it sort of nicely ties the whole area of, you know, we're practising wildlife gardening, but it's the, the bigger picture about our planet, isn't it, and how we can all do our little bit to, to help. Martin, we, we usually like to sort of come to a, our conclusion of our podcast to put you on a, a, a virtual desert island, um, shipwrecked, I'm afraid, <laughs> and we'd like to know what perhaps plant or garden implement you might want to have on your, uh, your virtual island to, to keep you perhaps sane. Right. Oh, good question. Uh, right. Well, I, if I'm if I'm thinking of a plant, I'm actually going to be practical. I think with this one. So I, I would say I would like an apple tree. I love apple trees. Mm-hmm. Um, I've over the years grown lots and lots of different varieties, I, and I enjoy grafting them um, and um, okay. and top grafting so you can get three or four different varieties on one tree, Excellent. which is a bit of fun to do. But if I could take a tree with me, um, I would probably take an apple tree and. There's so many wonderful varieties. I mean, the the obvious one that springs to mind would be the Bramley because it's a really good cooking apple and it lasts for a long time. But I'm just thinking I wouldn't want to eat them when you first pick mm, them off sour. the tree. <laughs> a bit sour. So, yeah. So I'm going to go for a an eating apple called Sunset, um, which is a bit, I think it's a, a relative a nice of, of, of Cox's Orange Pippin, but it's one that grows better in the north. Now, it may be this desert island, of course, is in the Pacific, so that wouldn't really matter. But <laughs> the Sunset is a is a good eating apple, and it, it's, it really is an easy one to grow. Um, so I would take Sunset. Um, as for a piece of equipment... Um, I think I'd take my secretaires with me mm. um, because I'd probably be wanting to cut things to make a shelter or I'd, I'd be, uh, you know, if I could find some fruit bushes, I've got to prune my apple tree, yes. of course, if I'm there for a few years to get a nice shape out of it and encourage fruiting. So I'd, I'd take my pair of trusty secretaires because you can use them for so many things in the garden um, mm. as well as cut pruning, you know, and uh, yeah. preparing my apples, chopping them up. So, yeah. Yeah, Apple Brilliant. Sunset, very appropriately named on your desert island, watching the sun go down. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I can sit there, yep. yes, with my apple juice yep. freshly pressed uh, from a sunset, watch the sun. That's a good one. That yeah, sounds good. Excellent. And you've obviously been uh, working in our industry for a few years now. Have you got any funny tales that you've come across uh, in your work in garden shows or when you've been judging that you could share with us, Martin? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, well, yes, I suppose so. Not, not so much on the judging side or not none that spring to mind. We'll probably finish this one and then one will immediately pop into my head. <laughs> but, uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very often, and this is an ongoing thing and it, it still happens to this day, very often when I'm doing talks to groups and clubs and societies, um, I'm introduced as Michael Fish. Um, <laughs> so that, that sometimes is a, a, bit, a bit embarrassing and I just laugh it off. And I, I once went to an event of many years ago and they'd actually advertised it as an evening with Michael Fish from the BBC. <laughs> and it was about 150 people there. Um, and, of course, they got me, so we had a gardening evening. It was a lovely evening, <laughs> but it was advertised as an evening with Michael Fish. But this this one also is, um, this is from one of the flower shows many, many years ago, uh, answering gardening questions. It was like a Q&A session. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a, a, a chap that came in, an elderly gentleman, and he came and sat near the front, and he had a, a brown paper bag. And um, I asked if he got a question and he said he had, and he took out an apple and he said, could the panel tell me what's the matter with this apple? So I took it up to the stage and I, I, I guessed what it was because I could see on the outside, it got these little dark spots, these blemishes, but we cut it open and the spots ran through. You've got these brown stains going through it. So we immediately knew that it was a problem called bitter pit. Which is a, a calcium deficiency on that uh, you probably know calcium deficiency on on apples. It was a Bramley apple, uh, and they're quite prone to it. So if they get a lack of calcium, um, you get this problem in the apple. It's a little bit like blossom end I suppose, on tomatoes, but it's the apple version. Perfectly edible. Um, you just get these little brown marks in the, in the white flesh. So we explained what it was, and I said to him, "Is this something that happens with your apples every year?" And he says, oh, I don't know about that. I've literally only just been and bought these from Tesco. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Oh, there you go. 
<laughs> so, yeah, we get all sorts of things when we're doing Q&A sessions. That's great. That's super, such a great story. Um, Martin, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. We've, gosh, we've covered an awful lot, and I'm sure uh, our podcast listeners will be uh, enlightened with your, your advice and information and, uh, and these wonderful stories from your, your own gardening uh, past as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Th- thanks, Martin. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk